Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. This summer's blockbuster movie hit came out of nowhere, which is fitting considering what it's about. We've never seen tornadoes like this before, and we need your help. No, I don't chase anymore. Kate, we can save lives. I'll give you one week. All right, fellas. We got PhDs from NASA, FEMA, and Kate. She's the smartest person I know. Hey, dudes. This is interesting. Who are they? Tyler Owens calls himself a tornado wrangler. If you feel it. That's a bit of Twisters. The follow-up to the 1996 film has pulled in more than $220 million at the worldwide box office. And like the original, storm chasers and scientists come together to face the overwhelming power of tornadoes. And like the last time, interest in storm chasing outside the movie theater is booming. Sean Waugh is a meteorologist with the United States National Severe Storms Laboratory at National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He's also a storm chaser and was a consultant on the new Twisters film. He's in Norman, Oklahoma. Sean, good morning. How's it going? It, well, it's going great. And and I saw the movie earlier this week and I thought it was pretty good. Thank you. I mean, I had a ton of fun making it. I mean, obviously, it's a, a whole family of people to, to make a film like this. And I had a great time and I'm glad everybody's loving it. I bet. So what lit the spark for you? Do you remember the first time you saw a storm and, and thought you wanted to get closer to that? Yeah, actually, my earliest memory as a child, I was probably four years old, I think, at the time. My grandfather had a farm in central Kansas. He was a wheat farmer, so he had a lot of crop. He had some livestock. And I remember very vividly one night I was you know, up there over the summer, and he was stressing out. He was pacing around the living room. He was really, really concerned because he'd been watching the news and the weatherman on TV was talking about this hailstorm that was nearby. And obviously he was worried about, you know, is it going to hurt his crop? Is it going to hurt his cattle? That sort of thing. It ended up not happening, which is good. Uh, But then he was, we'll say rather annoyed, right? He was using some colorful language, probably not appropriate around a Mm -hmm. four-year-old. But talking about the weatherman and how he he shouldn't listen to him because they're always wrong and they never get it right. And he doesn't know why he lets them like work him up so much. And I stood up at four years old. and I was like, Grandpa, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be a weatherman and I'm going to be right all the time. Mm. And he goes, well, you're, you're going to make a lot of money because you're going to be the only one and everybody's going to listen to you. <laughs> and it's, it's something that's just stuck with me. Right. I have never really deviated off of it. I've always wanted to be a meteorologist. It's It's been a passion of mine. Even at a young age, I was always fascinated with storms you know, run into the window every time it was lightning outside and, you know, asking questions about it. It's just been something that's driven me basically my entire life. Well, what is it about these storms that that makes you want to get up close and personal? I think for me, the biggest kind of drive factor for a lot of it is we know a lot about the atmosphere, but we don't know everything, not by a long shot. There are still so many questions that we don't understand. There's so many things that we don't really know how it works or how they interact to create the phenomenon that we see as weather, right? So there's all of this space in this field for exploration and for understanding. There's not really a set path. You basically just get to make it yourself. You get to figure out what questions you even need to be asking and then how to make the tools and the equipment that we need to go answer those questions. To me, that's really, really exciting and thrilling. And it's, it's, piques my curiosity a lot. It gives me a lot of like creative freedom with the work that I do Mm -hmm. is that sort of unknown, right? I can, I can figure all this out for the first time. Well, I think we need to start with the basics. What exactly is a tornado or twister? So a tornado or a twister, and they actually occur all over the world. The United States and also the southern part of central Canada is a very active area for these types of events. And essentially, it's just a violently rotating column of air. It's sort of a byproduct of the rotation inside a larger parent thunderstorm, a strong thunderstorm that we call a supercell. And that tornado, unfortunately, has the propensity to incur a lot of damage, and it can be extremely dangerous and deadly. Uh, to humans and structures that we have on the ground. So, you know, it's definitely something that we try to tell everybody to avoid as often as they can. So I always thought a tornado is a lot stronger than a twister. 
Uh, they're actually the same thing. So they're they're basically just different phrases. It's kind of a regional thing, depending on where you are. There's different variations of tornadoes or twisters. There's water spouts, which generally occur over water. Sometimes they can move onto land and cause damage. There's land spouts or dust devils, things like that, that occur on sort of clear air days when it's really hot. And you maybe have a few clouds in the sky, but you just get these, you know, nice little like concentrated areas of rotation at the surface. And uh, they're all basically generally the same name okay. for the same type of phenomenon. It's just the strength that really matters. Okay, well, now I know. <laughs> so what makes this different from a hurricane? So hurricanes are massive structures. I mean, we're talking, you know, hundreds of kilometers across. Uh, hurricanes can have winds well in excess of 100 miles an hour, and they cause destruction over very, very large regions. Comparatively, tornadoes are actually quite small. Most tornadoes are probably on the order of a you know, few yards wide, you know, maybe 50 yards wide, 100 yards wide. The largest tornado ever, and I mean the absolute record right now, actually occurred in May of 2013 here in central Oklahoma. Officially, the record is 2.6 miles wide, which is a, a pretty big tornado. I mean, that's that's pretty terrifying to think about. But in comparison to a hurricane, it's actually quite small. So help me to understand this a little bit more. Where do tornadoes mostly form? Are there certain areas that lend themselves more to good good tornado geography? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, you know, tornadoes do occur anywhere around the world. Uh, I haven't, I've been to Antarctica or, you know, the Arctic Circle, so I'm not sure if they were, they occur up there. I will have to ask the, you know, the penguins to see if they uh, see anything like that, but <clears throat> they do occur all over the world, <laughs> but the central plains of the United States. So like Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Southern Nebraska, Eastern Colorado, even like that's kind of an area that historically has been called tornado alley. Basically every spring between probably mid March and mid to late June is tornado season here, and we get a lot of tornadoes, and we get some pretty strong ones at that. Later in the season, so we're talking the fall for the United States, so you know September, October, November, all the way through probably February is the southeast part of the United States where we have sort of a second hot spot of tornadoes. And those can often occur late at night, you know, even into the overnight hours, you know, 4 or 5 a.m. And that actually makes it kind of dangerous. So it's sort of that central part of the United States down into the southeastern part of the United States. Well, I can tell you, Sean, I'm from Nunavut, which is in Canada's Arctic, and we never ever have to worry about tornadoes up there. So <laughs> the penguins and us, we would agree that, you know, it's, it's far from thought for us up there. So then how much science does science know about how these storms form and, and where they will go once they do? Right. So we've we've been studying tornadoes, I mean, probably as long as humans have been around, right? But I mean, for the last 30 or 40 years, it's been a very concerted effort. If you go back to the early 90s, there was a big project here in the States called Vortex, which is arguably the best named field project ever. But it was to study tornadoes. And one of the benefits that that did is if you roll back the clock 30 or 40 years ago, average warning lead time for a tornado warning is actually quite small. I mean, on the on the average, it was probably a minute or two, maybe. Most tornadoes either went unwarned or the warning came out after the tornado. Now we've significantly improved that. Average warning time is up to like 13 minutes, I think, or 14 minutes. Our ability to accurately predict events like this has gone through the roof. And I mean, we've got a lot of programs here at NOAA's National Sphere Storms Laboratory that we're working on. Things like the threats in motion or worn on forecasts that are taking a more probabilistic approach. So they're actually like gauging potential hazards and trying to narrow down that cone of where those hazards are going to go and add in timing information like five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, 15 minutes from now. And it's very dynamic. It changes with the storm versus these big sort of blocky warnings that we've been used to, you know, for decades now. So there's a lot of programs that we're improving on and, and working on to try to reduce that false alarm ratio and increase that warning lead time and narrow that warning so that it's more directly applicable to the people that are in it. We're actually starting to find out that there may be problems if we give people too much warning. They start to ignore the issue and then like go do something else and then they stop paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we don't know is what causes individual storms to produce tornadoes and not other ones, even though they're in the same environment, or what causes the variation in intensity and size and 
the damage that it causes. There's still a lot of questions associated with that. So while we have come a long way, there's still a lot we don't know. Well, let's move away from the science of tornadoes and talk about the movies now. Did you take any of the Twisters cast storm chasing as part of their research? I I did. So when we were filming um, last year at this point, I talked to the cast. I talked to several members of the crew. Even I've probably got a list of like 100 people that want to go storm chasing. Obviously, doing that during filming just wasn't really an option, right? You can Mm -hmm. imagine that me trying to convince Universal Studios to let their multi-million dollar talent go in the middle of filming (laughs) to go chase a tornado (laughs) is probably not a good liability risk, right? Uh, But earlier this spring, I did have the opportunity. I've stayed in contact with, with a number of people from the show, including... You know, Glenn, Daisy, Anthony, Brandon, uh, Katie, Tunde, you know, a lot of the cast. And I basically just reached out and I said, hey, guys, there's a day coming up that I think looks pretty good. Are you available? And mm-hmm. they were like on it, man. Mm-hmm. They, they wanted to go. They've been wanting to see a storm. So they actually came out. The day ended up not being a super big day. It's one of those days that, you know, a few days out looks great. And then by the time you get to the day, it, it kind of falls apart, which is good for everybody else in the country, you know, but not for storm chasing. Mm-hmm. But we we went out and I showed them the process and, and the forecasting. And, you know, we saw some storms. It just wasn't a tornado. It wasn't, you know, big hail, that sort of thing. But they had a blast. And I think it really gave them an appreciation for not only the work that we do as researchers, but also, you know, the environment of storm chasing and what it's like to be a storm chaser. And I think they loved it. And they want to come back, you know, <laughs> you've got to get them a, a good tornado season at some point. Well, beyond that, as a consultant, Sean, what was your role? So honestly, I I joke with a lot of people, there's probably not a part of the movie that I didn't touch. I design and build a lot of the research equipment that we use. And the film, and and namely the director, Isaac, wanted it to be as authentic as possible. So he brought like the art department and the set design teams to the National Weather Center here. And we spent a lot of time talking. And I was showing them like the different vehicles that we use and why we do certain things. And they were using all of this as inspiration for a lot of the stuff that you see in the movie. And I ended up talking to the art department team and I said, guys, look, like I build this stuff for a living. Let me do it. I can make it more authentic and faster, to be honest, than you guys probably can trying to reinvent it because I'm used to doing this. And they were like, sounds great. You know, tell us Mm -hmm. what you need. It's all yours. So I built several of the props for the movie. I helped design a lot of the uh, aspects of the vehicles, like what they should put on them, what they should look like, that sort of thing. I interacted with the group called Playback, which designs all of the graphics for the movie. I hand selected the radar imagery that you see. So every time you see a radar display, that is real radar data that I handpicked for the movie. I had conversations with Isaac and, and the cast about you know, lines that you should say and terminology and where you, you should point when you're looking at the radar, teaching them things like hand analysis. I mean, basically the whole gambit. I, I talked to almost everybody on the film to try to make it as real and as authentic and true to form as we could make it. And okay. I I think the results show that. Okay, I was about to uh, to ask. So then how <laughs> accurate, or at least how plausible is the science in the movie? Right. So I think everything in the movie that you see is based, at least in theory, on some actual piece of, of equipment, some actual piece of you know work or research that we're doing, or some theory or concept, right? Now, it is a Hollywood movie. It's Mm -hmm. meant to be dramatic. It's meant to be exaggerative (laughs) and over the top. And it absolutely delivers on that aspect. So there are a lot of things that are probably a little over the top compared to what they normally are. Like there's no way that we can tame a tornado. There's no way to Mm -hmm. kill a tornado. There's a deeper question there too, which is, should we, even if we could, you know, what kind of downstream effects would that cause if we start playing around with mother nature's energy balance? Um, so the, the film is fairly accurate in a lot of aspects. A lot of the equipment that you see is based on real technology. Honestly, I joke with people, the most unrealistic part of the movie is when they're chasing. They are the only people on the road, and that never happens. <laughs> there are so many other people that are out there, right? So I, I think a lot of it is a little exaggerative. It's It's a little over on the scale side of things, but it's all very realistic or plausible. Well, what about the radar tracking balls that we saw in the original film? You'll remember that those tracking balls were meant to better understand how Twister's formed. So is this a real thing now? 
So there are some people that have sort of worked on that. The biggest issue with like the little sensor balls is getting them compact and light enough to do what they're supposed to do, but also having enough power and sensitivity to measure what we need. So it's sort of a technology limitation. I think we're closer than we were 30 years ago at this point. But we do have something very similar to that, and they're called radiosons. And there's a different flavor of those depending on what company you buy them with but they're basically small sensor packages and the smallest one that we use is actually housed in like a small styrofoam cup and it flies on a very small weather balloon that we fill with helium so they don't get lofted by the tornado but we can launch swarms of these things you know 10 20 30 at a time and basically feed them into the storm and that do give information back about temperature and pressure wind speed wind direction that sort of thing so like we're kind of close uh, but we're we're getting there a little closer the first movie really piqued the public's interest in storm chasing now there are whole youtube channels dedicated to storm chasing as a scientist do you make a distinction between what they're doing and what you do as a storm chaser yeah, and I, I actually do both, so I can speak to both, right? Uh -huh. As a storm chaser, this is essentially a hobby. People just enjoy going out and watching the atmosphere, and it is awe-inspiring and, and beautiful in a lot of re respects to see the atmospheric change go from a nice sunny day to just this violently powerful storm that's you know producing hail that's the size of a grapefruit it's it's incredible to watch right so a lot of people will go out and they basically just watch that as a hobby they take photos they take videos some people do make a little bit of money selling that imagery you know that footage a lot of news networks will pay for that, but it's it's very difficult to make a living off of that. There are several people that have managed to do it. Uh, there's even a market for taking people out there, storm chasing tours mm. and things like that. But the ultimate point with storm chasing is that you're essentially just out there to observe, right? Like they just want to see what happens. Maybe you report it, you know, maybe you don't, that sort of thing. But it's really just to kind of watch. Research, on the other hand, has a science question that we're trying to answer, right? Where we have something we're trying to learn, and we have a very specific reason for being out there. And it's not just to take pretty pictures. Right. Well, it, it seems to be kind of risky. Do you worry about people's safety? I do. Uh, risk is obviously something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. And especially for this kind of stuff, it's gotten really easy nowadays. Everybody has a cell phone. It's very easy to find the nearest tornado warning and drive yourself to it, you know. And that can oftentimes put a lot of people in harm's way that don't really know what they're doing. Honestly, the most dangerous part of what we do, storm chasing or research alike, is driving. Just driving mm -hmm. in severe weather conditions. But also with the increase in popularity of things like storm chasing and, you know, the new movie is certainly going to feed into that. We see a lot of people out on these roads, roads that normally only have, you know, a dozen cars a year suddenly have a thousand people. And that's not an exaggeration. I've actually abandoned targets because there's too many people on the storm. I, I can't mm -hmm. get anywhere near it or I can't safely get out. Uh, I've seen people basically, you know change lanes like three lanes at a time and pull over onto the shoulder going from 80 miles an hour to zero like in a hundred feet jumping out of their car with a tripod right into the middle of traffic setting up on blind hills you know things like that like just a lot of decisions that you know as a as another driver on the road are just incredibly frustrating you're giving me a picture in my mind but i'm just wondering about you know traffic officers you don't see them out there <laughs> You know, handing yeah. out tickets to people who aren't <laughs> being good drivers or, you know. And I wonder, too, because they say there's an app for everything. Is there an app for storm chasing? Uh, there's there's several different radar apps that you can get on your phone that show, you know, current radar imagery and your GPS location and warning information. It pretty much does everything other than tell you exactly how to get there. Uh, you still have to know how to read the radar. You still have to be able to interpret it. I can't do that for you. Mm -hmm. But there's, especially here in the central plains of the United States, a lot of people are pretty used to looking at that radar imagery, right? So it becomes really easy for people that don't have the meteorology knowledge, but do have an enough knowledge to know how to read a radar to put themselves in a position to see something. But it can also put themselves in a position to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as a storm chaser, how do you approach a storm and stay safe? 
I probably have a higher threshold for what I'm comfortable with than most people Mm -hmm. do just because I do this, you know, all the time professionally. Uh, So a lot of times when I'm out storm chasing and I'm in my own car, I'll sort of approach the storm from an area that I can see what's going on. I can see the structure. I can see the hazards, but I'm not necessarily in the way. Right. Once a storm produces a tornado or it's producing big hail, you know, something that I want to get closer and I want to go see, I spend a lot of time basically playing chess, right? Where I'm trying to figure out, okay, here's where it is, here's where I am, here's the road network, here's how it's moving, et cetera. And I try to position myself to get closer to that while maintaining options to get out of the way. And that's the trick is that I never put myself into a position where I have no escape options. Because when you start reducing your escape options for things, that's when bad things start happening. Right. Well, okay. Well, let's end on the movie. You were in the movie. You you had a cameo part in it. Tell us what part of the movie should we look for you in? So you can see uh, the back half of me. You know, I, I joke that it's my best side, you know, the <laughs> side you can't see. Uh, both of the gas station scenes, I can be found in the movie with the actual trucks that we use in the real world. The the storm chasing vehicles, the research vehicles that we use at NOAA. Uh, you can see me climbing around on those, messing with equipment on it, you know, that sort of thing. I'm sort of in the background, but it's it's pretty visible. I've seen some different clips and things. I'm hoping they make it maybe into like a director's cut and or extended cut mm-hmm. later. But both of the gas station scenes, you can you can find me clamoring around on top of the car. Well, that is so cool. I'm going to have to go back and watch the movie for a second time to look for you. Absolutely. I mean, it's something that everybody can connect to, right? Everybody yeah. has some connection to the weather. They've got some weather story. It affects everyone. That's so this is something that we can all enjoy, I think. Okay. Well, have a good summer, Sean. Thank you. You too. Sean Waugh is a meteorologist with the United States National Severe Storms Laboratory at National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He's also a storm chaser and was a consultant on the new film, Twisters.